demographics. Fifth thing, what worked in the past when there was abundant land may not work when the populations reach a certain threshold. Tragedy of the commons, everyone thinks they can put one more beast on that land and suddenly it's degraded. Sixth thing, sometimes preventing customary access to, to crop residues um, after, a, after a crop may be seen as antisocial. So maybe you've got a bit of land that somebody is using, but and they're trying to munch, they're trying to leave the crop residues as munch to stop the um, torrential rain washing away the topsoil, but it's antisocial if they stop somebody else's cattle coming in to graze that land. Can we represent that onto a cadastre? Um, or water rights. Water rights are big in surveying. Um, what are the water rights if somebody digs a well? Are they going to be able to keep that water or does the whole community come to have a water right um, over that water? Jealousy, that's another big thing. Um, a, a good thing about communities is there's some resistance to, to tall poppies, um, people um, rising above the community, um, but it also has a negative side in that sometimes if somebody works on it is successful, um, which doctors are called in or whatever, and um, this is all part and parcel of, parcel of communities. And it's something we need to think about, are we able to represent that when we start to think of um, title leads or long reasons. So finally, just a final few points. Um, if we're going to go into to anywhere in the world and say um, something needs to change, We've got socially based tenure, we've got tenure in transition here, what are we going to do about it? Um, I think these are some of the questions we really need to start asking about that. First, is there really a need for more security of tenure? When I look at some of the communal areas in Zimbabwe, um, the land rights are actually pretty secure. Do we actually need more security of tenure or have we got another agenda um, that we're working on there? Um, or is communal land vulnerable? Is there a risk that um, government or um, people with lots of money can move in? Um, or what? How secure is that land? Um, is the land um, starting to be, it's quite close to an urban centre, people are starting to buy and sell the land, but they sell the land in good faith, and then a few years down the line, um, somebody comes in and says, oh sorry, that land's got to go back to the family. And is that land insecure? Do, do the people that have bought the land in good faith and the land rights lose that land again? What are you going to do about it in a um, cadastre? Second point. Sometimes, um, this is me as a human being, um, as well as me as a land state, saying sometimes if you can support and enable change that's already occurring, it's sometimes better than putting in an entirely new system because people already, if they're doing that, they know the benefits, um, they understand, they've squared it with their ancestors, they've squared it with um, their community, um, and maybe it's better to enable something that's happening already than to introduce an entirely new system. So to find out what unforced changes already occurring, um, sometimes we need to actually go into a, a uh, community and say, say, what's actually happening? What is your security? Are, is that starting to change? Are people starting to, to buy and sell land? Are they creating their own DIY title leads or what? Are they, are they still using ceremonies for the land? What are these, etc. And, yeah. Thirdly, what are the main sources of land rights security? Okay, I've, I've touched on that. Go in and ask people, what is to stop somebody else coming in to take this land from you? Maybe it will be something you're not expecting. Like they'll say, it's because there's an entry in the sub register. Maybe they'll say, it's because I've got this development baby certificate. So maybe that's something you can enable rather than starting up a whole new system. Are there any generic registers like a development data register that you might be able to enable? If so, how can you enhance it? Maybe, maybe a development data register, all you need to do
do, it's happened in some countries, is to go in with a GPS receiver and get a coordinate um, for the centroid of bits of land, and there's an address there, there's a geocode, and you can do a whole lot more things with that same land register. Maybe that's an iteration that would help people. Um, fifthly, in any, if you're going to introduce any new system, have you factored in this whole belonging to a community thing? I'll tell you a story. I've got a, I've got a PhD student at the moment who's, who's a Maori student. And he's looking at um, Maori land rights being introduced into mainstream planning in New Zealand. And he's also looked at Denmark and Sweden and the Netherlands. And he came to me and said, you know, I found a really um, interesting thing that some, some of these um, community housing developments are working better if you first have a whole introduction process to make people feel that they really belong and to buy in conceptually to that community. And he said that's exactly what we do in the Maori communities and it's happening in Denmark, it's happening in the Netherlands. Um, so we need to think how we factored in a very important belonging link. Sixthly, if you do think that you need some changes, are there real advantages for people? Have you explained them to the people? Are people clear, clear about what the advantages are? Sometimes new land registers don't work because people say, well, why should I use them? It's no better than what I have, and the new land register is suddenly obsolete because nobody uses it, they didn't understand it. Seventhly, quite importantly, um, people are going to keep understanding the boundaries they used to. Here's a boundary. It's a, it's a grass strip with a, a, a conservation um, drainage ditch there. That's the boundary that people are used to. If you as a surveyor want to go in and introduce a title deed, you've got two choices. Either you can do a topographic map of this physical feature, or you can simplify that boundary and say to people, okay, right holder A and right holder B, do you agree that this um, grass strip goes from here, I'm going to put in a peg to over there, um, and you can get, at that stage of adjudication, you can get a simplified data set, which is much simpler than the topographical map of the, of the boundary, um, which you can overlay on satellite images, topographical maps, rectified aerial photographs, whatever. So if you can simplify the data set, do it. Is it possible to make a phased transition? If you are going to change from socially based to formal tenure, can you do it in a sort of phased way? Botswana have done this. They've kept on um, the traditional authorities uh, as part of the land boards, gives them legitimacy, it makes a smooth transition. Ninthly, very importantly, is proposed technology appropriate and maintainable? I've looked all around the world, sometimes a consultant has come in and put in a whole lot of software and hardware and it's worked fine for a year and then it's just died and people are actually worse than they, are, they were before. And so check that proposed technology is appropriate and maintainable. So that's it really, um, I, I, it, it's just principles, it's, uh, it's totally unpolitical, it's what's happening all over the world, but um, it's hopefully some things to think about um, if we do um, think about changing what sort of land registration we've got now. See where land is on that continuum, see how people are already securing their land rights, and maybe see if we can enable those in any way. Thank you.
Maybe today we are not defining the box, so we are not totally um, confining our discussions to what we may understand theoretically or practically, but uh, we know from what is presented, quite a number of us may have to come in one way or the other, and we may want to express our views or to share. Um, what I will do is I will give the platform to Mr. Mulambo and Mr. Ali so that uh, they can uh, lead us in this discussion. So everyone is um, invited, please feel free to contribute. Okay, so uh, to make things uh, simple, I think we'll take uh, three questions at a time, uh, then maybe we'll allow our presenters to, uh, to comment on, on the questions. So if, if I can see by a raise of hands, uh, and you have a contribution, Mr. Lakana, and then you have a student out there. Right? Like uh, talking of this 99 years 
So I was thinking of all oh, they increase my pressure on land. Since it's not it's, it's not a commitment for the water. So that people would then end up buying land, those who are already rich, like we're saying those with big pockets, would then even engage in those leases, then they begin to dispatch land out for actual farmers because they got a sound financial making. So that they will, that would may increase pressure on the land now. So I was thinking maybe, say for five years to come, would they be still a two lane available to list to people who are not able to actually engage in those leases right now? Or they will now have to uh, be paying rent to those who are already on that list. So that would then compromise the security for the whole society on that end. I hope it's clear. Uh, so for now, I think we we'll allow um, our presenters to respond first. Then, after they've given their responses, then we we'll open the floor to anyone who would like to maybe add or comment on the questions that have been asked. Thank you. Um, I've not been in a position to establish the number of places that have been registered. Since uh, since uh, the land reform began, but I can tell you that as of 2017, I mean in 2017, only two leases were registered. That's 2017. Of course, that is notwithstanding the fact that there are quite a number of A2 farms that have been submitted for for these purposes. The statistic of two leases uh, registered in, in 2017 may mean a number of things, in my view. Number one, it is possible that uh, uh, there is no pressure on, on, on the farmers to actually proceed to register the leases so that they can use them as collateral because they don't find the value of any. That could be one of the reasons. And so, <coughs> the point is, if it was a competitive instrument for finances in the agriculture, there would be pressure to have many leases registered. Now, uh, the fact that there isn't, it means that people are not under pressure to register. Now, one of the things that we then want to look at is how is agriculture being financed in the country at the moment. Um, you, I think a few years ago, when the banking sector was, uh, was viable, uh, farming was being financed by uh, AFC, the Agricultural Finance Bank, uh, which has become Agribank. This is now this of the bank. But I think because Agribank does not even have the finance at the moment, government has chipped in and introduced command agriculture, where inputs are given to farmers and they use them uh, to, uh, they use those inputs and then they basically government can then recover uh, the cost of the inputs from the farmers once the harvest has been done. But uh, to what extent is that sustainable, given an environment where government itself is limited in terms of the finances that are available to it? Uh, the planning by farmers is then limited to what they can get from, from government. And the question is, are we there for uh, operating sustainably as in terms of what is uh, envisaged by the land administration model where you want to achieve uh, social sustainability, uh, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. Um, I hope I've answered the question. Uh, when I talked about uh, title things um, and uh, the perception uh, peddled by one 
senior one 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 person who is acting with this under the pseudonym of Igor Monga. Who, in my analysis, I get the impression that he's someone that is uh, close to government, that is close to the ruling party, and therefore uh, has got uh, clear, I mean, he's got an indication of some, he's probably informed by what is happening in government. I was basically saying that the perception is that we cannot be agitating for title it now because um, that will put our farmers in a situation where they end up with, uh, with uh, what may be perceived as defenseless species of paper because uh, once you get a title deed, it is an instrument that can then be freely traded on the open financial markets and therefore uh, limited the extent of protection that can be accorded to farmers. But that is not to say that the title deed is not important. In my view, it is extremely important. It is the um, widely accepted It is a widely accepted instrument for collateral. It is important, but the context in which we are living perhaps uh, leaves people with the impression of the set uh, memories that uh, giving people title may actually disempower our, our people. And this is then what I was talking about. Um, so, in my view, I think as what has come from uh, Dr. Goodwin, there could be other frameworks for agricultural finance uh, to the extent that we are saying that let there be a meeting of minds between or amongst the various stakeholder institutions uh, uh, arising out of their participation in crafting instruments that are acceptable by banks, that are acceptable by government, um, that are acceptable by the farmers, and through which government can regulate, I hope I think that I also attack the, the third person, government can then regulate uh, in a way that is acceptable by banks, in a way that is acceptable by farmers, in a way that is accepted by the Behaps Land Commission to ensure that there is no capture of land by people with deep pockets. So that the national imperative uh, policy framework that government is pushing uh, is maintained, which uh, I think the objective of the land reform is to reduce poverty, uh, to increase the contribution of agriculture to the GDP by uh, availing land to a majority of the people and also to ensure that there is environmental sustainability in land administration. Uh, I hope I've attended to all the questions, but if, it, if not, then perhaps I can get some clarification.
for this. Uh, the first thing is um, uh, in Zimbabwe, never underestimate uh, how much uh, the populace at any level have bought into the idea of uh, freehold or formal ownership of land. I have been to very many forums, people are criticizing uh, the social based systems uh, in terms of uh, security of tenure. Uh, but uh, when I started working, my mother told me that don't do the mistake that we did uh, to invest our first savings in the uh, communal area and build a beautiful house. And they were right, because as we are talking, both the deceased and the other houses in the communal area with no one occupying it. So, as a country, we are far ahead of the rest of Africa in terms of that level of appreciation. That's an important too. If you go around the Harare, the Perim, the Osha, Sege, there's a, as we are seated here in an operation called Operation Karawaja. And the operation Karawaja means that sell your land within the periphery of Harare before the government or the local authorities extend the boundaries of the city. And then they will just, probably, you won't get it uh, with this competitive price as if you sell it in advance. And those people are in the communal land crying and clamoring for title deeds. Uh, Dr. Godwin, if you look at the records of the local government from 1980, the surveyor general, including in the growth point, has never satisfied the demands of freehold title deed in this country, just as, a, as some indications. Uh, I think, Dr. Masasi, I, I want to thank you. Uh, I think uh, basically what you, you were saying, it was a resonance with an entrepreneur, a business person, and the person who is really, who really makes the good of, I think the reasoning around the fact that the government declared all agricultural entities, that is the underlying a area of concern. It doesn't matter what other cosmetic changes are meant. As long as there is that uh, understanding that all agricultural statement period, anything else, whether there's 1,000 years, 99 years, uh, is the security of tenure will remain, uh, I think, questionable. You know, the government has made it very clear that they are going for 99 years. So each time they meet with the Beggars Association of Zimbabwe to try to improve that piece of paper, everyone is literally feeling intimidated to really debate that openly. So the Beggars will always say, ah, no, Mr. So, Mr. That is okay, we are fine with it is now. But how many times has it come into the public media uh, with the headline, the Beggars have now accepted the 99 years. If you go and Google, that title has been in the paper for more than 10 times, where the government has been that beggars have now accepted. After a few months, they say our ah, beggars are now changing their mind. Then the next week, beggars have now accepted. Then ah, the beggars have changed, and it keeps going. So I think your point is that there's need for open dialogue, open engagement, to hear what exactly to the citizens and society wants, I think this is the one of, I have a number, but I can't go on, no, let me give a understanding, so thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Mutema, for the questions. Now, we, can we take the second question? Uh, my name is Charles Chukizo, I'm doing agricultural engineering. Uh, my question is to Mr. Gordon. Uh, when I was mentioning that in communal areas, um, the headmen are the ones who have the registers of the people on the land. But I'm saying that uh, is there has there been, especially in Zimbabwe, has there been that security that says that the ownership of that land is actually secure enough 
because I'm saying in the next future, in the next years, there's going to be there's going to be an increase in population, and therefore there's going to be an expansion of the markets from the uh, urban areas up to the, to those communal areas, and uh, the affluent people are just going to go to those uh, that they're going to go to the affluent people um, as giving them money, and then the people do not have enough uh, security to their land. Is to what extent is that gonna uh, affect the communal area people? Well, thank you for thank you for the question. Uh, can we have that question before giving the mic to our president? Thank you. Uh, my name is Timothy Nashu. Asking in reference with something that happened here in Zimbabwe some time ago. There was a time when some residents in Woody Hill they bought land from the private sector and uh, that land went on to be taken by the Harris City Council, claiming that uh, it was going to lead to, to build houses there and also claiming that they had future aspirations uh, to build a school. So my question goes on further to Dr. Gopin saying, do we really have the secure, uh, are the new systems in Zimbabwe really that secure? Thank you.
thanks to Dr. You mentioned that uh, the governor he, he has always come out in the media saying the banks have agreed uh, to collateralize and securitize the what the 99 years. We haven't yet an authentic statement from the bankers association themselves. Our members have gone to banks with the old offer letter or all this and they've been asking that the usual terms and conditions will apply. Which means your offer letter or your list comes as an added thing at the last of your applicant. Sometimes they don't even ask you for evidence or proof of labor. As long as you produce a title deed, that is what authentic thank you. Thank you very much for that, Max. Uh, so for now, we have time to uh, us to, to respond and make a few answers. But uh, because of our time, I will ask us to be as brief as possible. Uh, but in the process, not uh, clarifying whatever we want to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm very happy to be brief. Um, so very good. Excellent points there. Um, I'm certainly not saying that um, things like places like growth points um, are wrong. I think they, they're absolutely necessary. As the speaker said, that, you know, we've never satisfied demand for those. Growth points are almost under a, dis a special dispensation of land. They, they communal land which has become urban land, so pockets of urban land. And that, that is under a, a completely different, a different dispensation from um, communal land itself. I think all I'm saying is don't force change where it's not needed and it's not understood. And if you do uh, bring about change, check that there are not some people that do have latent rights on that land who've been investing on that, in that land for for years and years and years thinking that's where they're going to come back to for old age or unemployment or whatever and suddenly somebody else's name is on the title deed you haven't got a social security system and those people don't have the rights that they, they thought they enjoyed so I'm just saying um, you know just just be a little bit cautious um, that you're getting all the people that have rights in that land represented on the title deed this, this happened in New Zealand they, um, People, a whole community would have rights in land. People would have invested in that land for many, many years. And suddenly, in the, in the 19th century, um, government, in their short sightedness, said, OK, let's just create title deeds and we'll have five owners, five people can have their names on that title deed. The rest of the people forget it. And suddenly, those five people had sold all that land. <laughs> And the people that thought they had land rights didn't have land rights. So that's what I'm just saying. It's just, just be a little bit cautious there. Um, but some excellent points there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, maybe we just talk about uh, what I referred to as uh, what can be perceived as an invisible hand. It appeared that, you know, by saying we want to uh, give 99 year leases, you, and, and in the lease agreement, you define uh, people that qualify and people that don't qualify. You are, as a matter of fact, taking by one hand what you have given, by another hand, to the extent. The, the effect of which is to dilute the integrity or the authenticity of the 1998 as a Kenya instrument. Uh, this is what I'm sort of like referring to as the, the invisible hand, because what it then does is to interfere with the operation of the financial markets to the extent that the lease. Uh, becomes non-competitive. No one really would want to then buy it. Um, I, I 
think that uh, what uh, the Zimbabwe Commercial Farmers Union has said that there is no propensity for farmers to borrow from banks. This is exactly what I'm saying. Because if there is uh, alternative funding for agriculture, which is coming free of charge, uh, no interest is possible, uh, why would anyone want to go and get more expensive money if you can get cheap money? Uh, but I can guarantee you that uh, the moment that the government says that uh, those that there is no more command agriculture, or if you have qualified for command agriculture finance in the past five years, the sixth year you are no longer eligible because we hope that we have grown. You will see those farmers going to the financial institutions to borrow money to sustain their production activities. Um, again, in terms of the option to, to purchase, uh, I talked about uh, South Africa where it is owned by through leases or, or through the lease agreement. But this is also for certain types of, uh, of, of land. You can still get people buying land and getting title in, in South Africa. Uh, and uh, maybe not, not in Mozambique, but in other countries, there is a mixture of tenure types. So I would not have a problem with that personally, but I think this is what the government is trying to avoid, possibly uh, in the process of engagement between or amount of stakeholders, this is where uh, an appropriate tenure framework can then be defined and possibly allowing for mixed, uh, mixed uh, uh, tenure systems where some, uh, mixed tenure types where some farms are on by title of and others by leasehold. But in any case, in this country at the moment, there are also some farmers that have got title to their land. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, whether that is going to be allowed is going to really depend on the process of engagement. Uh, then one of the reasons, one of the things that is important when I was talking about the international performance of leases elsewhere as a successive uh, in the profit method of uh, uh, land tenure, you know, what that brings up to mind is the question of is there a problem with the 99A lease action? Because if South Africa is using that and their farmers are getting financed on the basis of that, why would it be a problem? So there may be a number of reasons, and this is why I say there are issues of perception of how we have done our things in the past, which is what sort of like scares. Uh, us because uh, as part of our history uh, we have done we have taken over and in other words we have prevaricated we have wavered on the, uh, whether you put a list for a type of it doesn't really matter if there is no consistent government policy the government can still wake up and take your land not withstanding that you want your deed and these are the perceptions that we need to manage and deal with there is also an issue that tends to, in my view, really just have an estimate for um, extending finance. The fact that uh, when we, you see, when the land reform uh, began early in the 80s, one of the models, the A2 model, was uh, open to people that would have passed through agricultural trade. But the element of trade uh, I think by and large fell away during the first trade land reform to the extent that some of the farmers that got land were basically people that do not have any trade in agriculture. They have that way acquiring that land for speculative purposes. Now, the ability of such a person to prepare a competitive uh, business model uh, based on farming becomes limited because of his training. Uh, he perhaps doesn't understand that farming is a business, 
which needs to be undertaken to make a profit. And therefore, uh, the bank will naturally perceive that person to be a very risky borrower. And therefore, may not be maybe willing to extend finance to that kind of person. Um, maybe I wanted to to also discuss the little you know, case. Um, but uh, perhaps the question can be repeated so that I can try to articulate it. Thank you.